Kundalini After Dark. Today's topic is Shaktipat experiences, the transmission of divine power. I'm your host, Brent Spirits. If you're listening in on the podcast on Spotify, this is the Spiritual Awakening Show. If you're live with us on Zoom, live with us on YouTube, thank you so much for making this a fun, interactive event. All right, so today I've got some, some far out stories to share about my various experiences with Mission and Shaktipat. Okay. So what is Shaktipat? Shaktipat is the transmission of the divine power of Shakti. Now, I know that many of us here have experienced this. Some of us perhaps have been on the giving end of the Shaktipat type of transmission, as well as, of course, the receiving end. So Shaktipat is giving and the receiving of the radiance of the energetic flow of consciousness, the energetic flow of consciousness, which is of course Shakti. So in the most traditional stereotypical sense, Shaktipat is when an Indian yoga guru blasts their disciple with energetic power, awakening their Kundalini Shakti and accelerating their spiritual development. So that's the stereotypical image that you may have of an Indian guru, maybe looking at somebody with uh, a very powerful gaze, maybe tapping them on the head with a peacock feather, touching them on the third eye, awakening their Kundalini Shakti. However, this is definitely not the only way that we can receive a transmission of Shakti. Okay. Of course, we know this is a universal human phenomena, a human development, a transformation that we all have the potential to go through, which is of course, Kundalini awakening which is uh, an Indian word comes out of yoga, Sanskrit word, but it's a human experience. And so uh, the transmission of this power, it's not limited just to uh, you know, an Indian yoga guru per se. So before I, I proceed here talking about Shaktipat, I just want to mention a very quick and important note here. Those who give Shaktipat in any form are not necessarily perfected beings, uh, many who can give Shaktipat, who have this ability, this gift of being able to transmit Shakti, they may still have a lot of personal work to do, a lot of healing work to do, a lot of karma to burn up for themselves, shadow work. They may have areas, blind spots in their uh, personality and their disposition. Okay. So don't be um, naive and think that just because somebody has this ability to give Shaktipat that they are infallible that you can trust them fully with your whole life is not true okay it is not true and we'll unpack this a little bit more okay so we must use discernment we must have boundaries and we also must hold these people who are offering shaktipat in an active way we hold them to very high standards in order to keep ourselves and our communities safe okay and i share this because of course in the past there have been and not even just the past presently there are many people who have this ability to give Shaktipat, genuine transmissions of Shakti, genuinely uh, awakening people's Kundalini, genuinely giving them um, an accelerated catalyst to you know, move ahead on their spiritual development. And yet, though they're able to give this genuine gift of Shaktipat, they are also caught up in all sorts of scandals, all sorts of abusive situations, all sorts of, of really ugly things. Okay. So this is why we must use our discernment. Okay. So we'll unpack this a little bit more together and I'm, I'm open to others thoughts as well on these things. Um, so let's keep going here. So, so there's an active way of giving and receiving Shakti pots, which is of course, like the stereotypical idea of, you know, meeting with an Indian guru. However, those with awakened Kundalini Shakti that have reached a point where there's a steady flow of that energy through their system, unimpeded, their system has been adjusted um, to the energy flow they can really just let it just sort of uh, surge through the system. They can begin to transmit their own Shakti field and others can begin to pick up on this. And so when they're transmitting, it's not necessarily in an active way. They're not actively going up to people and touching them on the third eye or, or saying, you know, I'm going to give Shakti pod. They're just living. They're just allowing that energy to flow through their own body and through a sort of uh, osmosis, through a sort of, uh, you could say maybe it's like um, it's contagious 
others can pick up on it in the energy field and they receive this sort of transmission in a passive way unintentionally. Okay. So there's the active way and there's the passive way that, you know, Shaktipak can take place. Okay. So in those situations, it kind of just happens spontaneously Two individuals or, or a group begins to harmonize with one another. Okay. And this is how others can receive a transmission. Now, where it gets even more interesting, if it's, of course, I think this is one of the most interesting facets of the Kundalini Awakening journey, but where it gets even more interesting is that we can receive Shaktipat without actually being in the physical presence of an individual, a person with awakened Kundalini, whether they identify as a teacher, a guide, a healer, or not, anybody with awakened Kundalini that's got that flow can begin to radiate, and, and we actually don't need to be in their physical presence. So this transmission can actually happen over very long distances. It can happen through live video calls, through live audio calls, um, and even recordings, even recordings. So some may be picking up on something here today. It's not just me. It's the whole field that we are all uh, contributing to together, um, because I'm sure many of us, uh, nearly all of you have been in touch with have awakened Kundalini. And so we're, we're harmonizing, we're, we're feeding into this Shakti field together, even though we're coming to us coming to each other from all around the world, right? We've got Hugo in Australia. We've got people in the States. We've got people in, in South, South America, Asia, all over the world. But together, there's this harmonizing happening, um, which perhaps you can pick up on it, perhaps not. Um, if you're you know, unsure about it, skeptical about it, no problem at all, that's, that's fine too. You don't have to believe anything here. Experience for yourself and, and come to your own conclusions. Um, and so you know, it is hard to believe, you know, how can it happen, you know, without being in the physical presence of somebody? Well, the whole thing is hard to believe, isn't it? Right. So Shakti is all around. Shakti is the, the energy of consciousness in a manifested form, right? It's the, the flow of consciousness that has, has come together as this universe, as you, as me, as, as this microphone, as everything all around. And so the Shakti field is everywhere. Okay. So in this field, time, space, distance, all non-issues, all non-issues, okay? As well, what's interesting here is that we don't even need to be in the contact with another human individual, per se, to receive this flow of Shakti. We can simply enter into a receptive devotional state and soak in the Shakti that's all around us, right? So it's especially palpable in nature. It's especially palpable in place of worship in places where people have been, say, practicing in deep meditation, allowing that Shakti, that Shakti field to surge through their system. They leave a bit of a, a residue, a bit of a, they shift the vibe in that location. This is why you can go out to maybe a, a temple, a monastery, and you kind of enter and there's this, this peace comes over you. And go out in nature, you feel peaceful. Conversely, the energy field can also have uh, some darker areas too, a very contracted uh, type of experience. So for example, many people may describe they go to a place like Auschwitz, right? And they feel this huge, heavy, dense energy. And uh, sometimes it can be really overwhelming. They want to run away, right? It's because they're picking up on the vibes in that place, the vibes that have been uh, sort of saturated in that place. And so you can go to a place and also receive a transmission of Shakti as well, okay? Just by entering into a receptive, receptive, relaxed, open state we can do a visualization where we just imagine light permeating our system. We can imagine our system as a sponge. We can just soak it all in. And the paradox here is that even when we are asking for Shaktipat, for example, we're not asking with attachment to the outcome, whether we receive it or we don't. We're just open, receptive. And we say, if it comes, it comes. That's out of my hands. It's all that's up to the divine, but I'm here receptive. So that's the paradox. If you are needy, for it. You say, I really want it. That's not true receptiveness. True receptiveness has no attachment to actually receiving. So this is a, the paradoxical way we can receive Shaktipat without actually going to say a, a yoga guru per se, right? So let me share some of my experiences here with these types of transmissions, receptions of Shaktipat. Um, before we begin here, I know that in our, our Facebook group, we were discussing a little bit about you know sharing some of these ideas and these experiences that we've had it's definitely something that i think we should talk about briefly here so some of these experiences are really far out really intimate really personal um they can be absolutely unbelievable 
like this is the stuff that people i wouldn't blame anybody if they said you're crazy or i'm crazy if we speak about these types of things not only that they can be so incredible that they can stir up a lot of maybe jealousy comparison in others who say haven't had this type of experience and we don't want to do that to uh, others as well make them feel you know all sorts of insecurities and whatnot so there are some caveats around sharing here now a great uh, energy healer, which I'll speak about her, her in a little bit. Early on in my journey with Kundalini, I connected with her. And I was having all these far experiences. And I asked her, I said, you know, what, what do I do with these experiences? You know, I know there's a general sentiment, you know, we, we should, you know, be silent about them. Don't fixate on them. Don't become attached to these experiences. Um, but at the same time, like, you know, I, I do have this urge to share. I want to talk about it what's the uh, what's the deal here? And so what she told me was, look, some experiences, very personal, very intimate, you keep them to yourself. They're very sacred. But every now and then, when you feel called to share a thing or two, just so that other people out there know what's possible. That's all. Just so other people know that this is possible and that they can say, oh, okay, this happened to me too. I know I'm not crazy. I know I didn't make it up. I know what word to Google to find more information. So that's why we share to just kind of spread the word to support one another. Okay. As well, perhaps maybe you're challenged by some of your experiences. You want some answers. Then you share and you say, this happened to me. What's going on? Can I get some help? Can I get some support? All valid reasons. Okay. So here today, I invite others to share and I'm going to share as well, but know that, you know, we're not sharing here to brag. We're not sharing here to uh, say, you know, I, this happened to me or this great, master gave me shakti pod and this and that we're not coming from that place we're saying hey this is a real thing this is what we experienced right we're not alone and we're not crazy in fact you know um bragging about this i think is just a foolish idea to begin with i mean you don't really get praised when you talk about this stuff you get kind of labeled like you're a nut so there's not really much to gain um on, in terms of um you know uh accolades per se. But uh, for the sake of supporting one another, for the sake of getting this out there a little bit more, we're going to talk today. And that's the idea of the after dark sessions. So we're here to just connect and share. Okay. This stuff is happening to more and more people all over the world. And now we need to have some conversations about this more openly. Before in the past, it was very, you know, limited to very sp specific uh, uh, traditions, certain spiritual sects, would uh, you know talk about it in secret? You'd have to approach a teacher, and you know they may give you a little bit of a brief tidbit, a hint or two, and that was it. But now it's happening at such a high rate. I mean, there's you know 20 plus people here. I don't know how many people are watching on YouTube, but there's like maybe like 40, 50 people in total that are going to come through our meeting today. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of people, especially you know this is of course a, a late night show. It's happening to more and more people. We got to start talking. Okay, we have to talk just to raise awareness. Okay. As well, not only are people receiving Shaktipat and all these interesting ways that we're going to talk about, they're also giving it unintentionally to others. They're just radiating, radiating it unintentionally to other people. And um, they don't know what's happening. Not always. They're like, oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know, um, you know that another person was going to have a Kundalini awakening just because I did. I didn't know my partner was going to start going through this because they you know, came in contact with me. Is it my fault? What's going on? I don't know. How do I, how do I deal with this? How do I navigate with being a transmitter, a radiator of Shakti? Do I turn it off? Should I go live alone? Should I live in isolation? So people having these types of questions. So of course, no, no, you don't have to live alone. You don't have to run away or, you know, uh, try to turn off the flow. We just have to understand it. And we understand it through, through conversations. Okay. So ultimately here, it's not about receiving Shakti pot. The events of actually receiving the Shakti pot. That's cool, but it's not really about that specific event. It's about what you do with what you've received. It's about what you do with the energy flow that's now moving through your system, how you handle it, right? How do you allow it to transform you? How do you surrender to that process and work with it in a collaborative way? That's what really matters, okay? So let's talk about like some of the passive ways that some can radiate the Shakti. So uh, very early on, a few months prior to my own major Kundalini rising, which uh, took place uh, in 2015. So this was in 2015. Very good friend of mine. He's sick. 
he's, uh, he's got brain cancer. And so we connect through some mutual friends with the great energy healer. We figure, you know, let's, let's see, uh, whatever we can do for my friend. Um, back then I knew a little bit about energy healing, but I didn't know much. I didn't know much about Kundalini. I didn't know anything about Kundalini really. Anyway, we go to pick up this energy healer, um, to take her to the hospital with my, with my friend. And, um, as I see her walking down the street to approach the car, there's this palpable energy field that kind of whooshes me. And she's about a hundred feet away, just whooshes me. So that was the first sort of encounter I had with this sort of passive, uh, transmission of Shakti. Now we sat with her in uh, the hospital room. She's conducting an energy healing treatment on my friend. We dim the lights. I go into a meditative state and, uh, you know, I'm picking up on some pretty powerful vibes in the room. Uh, interestingly, uh, the nurse came to sort of check his temperature and do some measurements or something. And, and her devices, her tools weren't working. She's like changing the battery. She's going to other nurses and saying, Hey, can I borrow your tool, your thermometer or whatever it was? And it's not working. Like the, the device is not functioning properly. And the healer is just continuing in her, her energy healing state, um, you know, transmitting that energy. And it's of course affecting the electronics in the room. Anyway, a couple months later, we, we continued to do uh, some, some sessions with her. And so I got a chance to connect with her um, just chatting about whatever, you know, not even chatting about anything super far out or spiritual per se. Anyway, a couple months later, things line up for me. I have this huge energetic rising. It wasn't just solely because I crossed paths with her, but she was a, a factor in it, I think. And so um, eventually I had this uh, uh, energetic awakening and I thought, you know, um, I don't know who will have any answers for me. I don't know what I just experienced. I had this energetic explosion up the spine. I think it's this thing called Kundalini. So I approached her. I said, Hey, can I just talk to you for a minute or two? I think I had a Kundalini awakening. Do you know about this? And she says, oh yeah, this happened to me about 15 years ago. Oh, I, I started crying. I felt so relieved. I also felt so much trust in the universe that the universe brought me to the right person who had some answers for me. So she was able to support me a little bit. She was doing some, some energy healing sessions in her, her, uh, her clinic. And I was completely broke, completely flat broke, quit my job as this energy was moving through my system. And so I would just sit in her waiting room as she treated my, treated my friend and in her waiting room, there was, you know, radiance of Shakti. So I would just sit in that field and just get whatever I could soak in whatever I could to support me on my path. So that's one way in a sort of passive way. She didn't come up to me and say, Hey, I'm going to give you a Shakti pot transmission. She didn't touch me on the forehead, nothing like that. It was just because she's just in the flow. The energy was flowing. So what's interesting here is like I said earlier, not everyone that transmits Shakti in any way, whether it's passively or or actively um, has done all their work. It's not that anybody who has this ability has no shadow, has no ego, is not selfish, is not, you know, uh, is incapable of doing harm, right? It's not true at all. Okay. It's very, very important to understand this. Just because somebody has a very palpable energy field, the gift of Shaktipat does not mean their work is done. Okay. As I said before, there have been many teachers, many gurus, many guides that have given Shaktipat in an active way but then also have found to be abusive to their followers, like very abusive, like horrible atrocities, okay? So this is very important to keep in mind. The ability to give Shaktipat is not as advanced of a skill as it may seem to be. Yeah, we're talking about it in, in, as if it's the most incredible thing, and I think it is pretty incredible, but it's not that advanced in actuality. Just let that sink, sink in. The ability to give Shaktipat is not that advanced of an ability okay keep that in mind very very important much work still needs to be done in most cases for most individuals even after they learn how to give shakti pot even after the energy is flowing through their system even after maybe other people are picking up on all sorts of energy as a result of crossing paths with a particular individual, it does not mean that individual's work is done. It does not mean that they're God. It does not mean that they're a saint. It does not mean that they can do no harm. Okay. Very, very important. So for example, the energy healer that I was speaking about, though, like I said, though, she was not necessarily giving Shaktipat in an active way. She definitely had a very powerful transmission and definitely had a very powerful radiance in her field. Like I said, from a hundred feet away, I felt a huge whoosh as she approached the car. However, 
some years later, I got, you know, generally speaking, quite close with her. And I watched her go to a very dark place, very dark place. Um, emotionally, in her personal life, came, you know, a lot of stuff was coming up for her. I didn't see her necessarily harm another person. She didn't harm me. She actually became self-destructive as she began to face her own shadow in a very direct way, okay? So unfortunately for her, she was known as, you know, a great wise healer. And she, she was, I mean, she helped my friend out. Um, she helped me out on my own journey as well, like in a very direct way. She gave me many gold nuggets of wisdom. Um, however, because she was known as this great wise healer in the way that I see the situation, you know, when her own stuff began to come up, I think it was very difficult for her to recognize that she still had work to do, right? It's very difficult, you know, once you kind of get uh, uh, the sort of identity around being, you know, somebody who transmits, somebody who heals. So the wise person that everybody goes to, I think can be difficult to then say, okay, you know what? I got to do a lot of work on myself too still. It can be very difficult, okay? So I'm sharing this because I know many of us may encounter an individual who can give Shaktipat. That's great. But I'm also sharing because many of us I know will likely at some point or another become very radiant. And we should also know that that doesn't mean that our work is done yet. We should also continue to be mindful, humble, and conscious of our own work, our own shadow, and do our best to, you know, keep, uh, keep watch and not to, uh, you know, become destructive towards others or towards ourselves, right? So the same sort of thing goes for myself too, okay? At the end of 2019, uh, I experienced a, a really powerful meditation. And in this rising, sorry, in this meditation, I experienced uh, uh, another Kundalini rising. It's pretty powerful. It's a pretty far out experience. I found myself in the presence of, of my guides, some of my guides, presence of the divine feminine. And I was, uh, you know, shown an opportunity. I was given an opportunity to accept this mission to support people going through awakening at this time of ascension on the planet. I said, okay, and that's, of course, blossomed into what we're doing here. So I thank you all for being part of the mission. But in addition to being shown the mission, I was also shown how to give Shaktipat. Now, in this experience, I was shown a state of consciousness to enter into, to give Shaktipat. Okay. But that was 2019, right? Four years ago. So over the next four years, I have uh, continued to do my own work. I've continued to sit in meditation, to read to uh, seek, seek support from people more ahead of the journey than I am, okay? A lot of work still comes up. I still get caught up in my own emotions and get triggered. Um, my shadow is still there. I'm still working on all of these things, despite being shown how to give Shakipat four years ago, okay? So I've never actively given anyone Shakipat, okay? Because I recognize that I'm not ready to take on such a role, to take on such uh, responsibility, right? And the reason being is that these types of transmissions can be very powerful. And of course, they can require an individual on the receiving end to lead a, to need a lot of support as the energy begins to purify them. And so uh, it's for this reason that I haven't um, actively given Shaktipat. It's not something that I offer as say, a service in the way that maybe other teachers might. Um, I also surrender completely to the divine, to the Shakti, to the goddess. If she would like me to, begin offering this, well, I invite her to, uh, you know, give me some, some next steps. Until then, I just be myself, follow what she asks me to do. Like say, set up a meeting like this. We sit, we talk. Some people may pick up on some uh, of the energy field that we create together, right? Maybe not. I don't know. But I just lean more into a passive, spontaneous type of transmission. That's my style and my approach. Um, whereas others, like I said, they may have a more active way. And so for these types of reasons, I advise everybody who may be shown how to give Shaktipat in an active way to uh, also be conscious and mindful of the way that they conduct themselves in this area, especially, okay? Because it's, it's a very intimate, very delicate type of dance, a delicate dynamic as well. Um, even in giving Shaktipat in an active way, we can also take on an individual's uh, karma. We can kind of get enmeshed in their aura. They can be all sorts of... Uh, weird um, energetic phenomena that happens between individuals. It also be all sorts of uh, relational dynamics. Projections can happen. People may say that you're, you know, their savior, you're, you're God. They may look at you as if you're all sorts of things. So it's this very delicate uh, process, a delicate um, 
power that should be wielded with, with care, right? Um, for those who are simply very radiant and find that they're spontaneously and passively transmitting to Shakti, transmitting Shakti to others, there's nothing to worry about. So sometimes people feel that when they, uh, you know, have their own Kundalini awakened, they feel, oh no, that means I'm kind of contagious. I might awaken it in my partner or my family or, you know, somebody that crosses my path. It's, uh, that's out of your hands. It's nothing to worry about. It's nothing to hold back on or, you know, stop the flow or run away. Like I was saying, uh, Shakti is an intelligent energy. I mean, this is infinite intelligence of the divine mother of the universe flowing through you. So those who need to receive Shakti will receive as much as they need. So we don't have to worry or avoid being around other people. If we feel that we're radiant, we just radiate. We, we abide in the deepest, most highest deepest, highest, um, you get what I mean, um, states of consciousness. And uh, we just be ourselves. And if others are meant to pick up on some of our Shakti, they will, they'll pick up as much as they need. And that's, uh, you know, it's not something that we need to manage per se. Also keep in mind here, it's not actually, it's actually not that easy to receive Shakti in a form of transmission, right? If it were, everybody on earth would have their Kundalini awakened, right? It would spread like wildfire. As we know, certain things spread around the world. If Kundalini was so uh, easy to spread, you know, we wouldn't be here, um, um, you know, talking about it in this way after dark, we'd be talking about it openly and be on the news. But of course, it's, it's not that easy, right? So uh, keep that in mind as well. You don't have to fear that you're going to be going around awakening everyone's Kundalini and putting them through a say a intense dark night of the soul or intense purging or, you know, causing them to maybe feel like they're crazy. It's not like that. Trust in the intelligence of Shakti to manage the doses that are given out, given out, to whoever is in a receptive place. And this goes for also those who maybe feel like, um, you know, they go to a certain teacher, guru, whatever it is, and everybody, everybody else is receiving a whole, you know, a big dose of Shakti. And then you go to the guru and you're not really getting anything, right? Does it mean the guru is fake? No. The teacher? No. It doesn't mean that. It just means, you know, you get what you need. And if you don't need anything in this moment, you won't get anything, right? And so this is what's important to keep in mind. There've been many great, powerful, powerful saints with huge energy fields that's, you know, gifted so many people with, you know, Shakti and changed their lives. But not everybody that crossed paths with those particular saints, gurus, teachers, guides experienced something profound. Some people just said, what's the big deal with this person? Just, just you know, just seems like a normal person to me. So you can keep that in mind as well. You may not pick up on it from everybody and everybody may not pick up on it from you. You have to be in the right place, the right time. And that's up to the divine. It's up to the flow to line those, line those things up. As well, we can also receive a strong transmission of Shakti through objects, say like a book, for example. Um, some books that I can mention in particular, Matt Kahn's books, I find them to be radiant with Shakti. Um, whatever arises, love that. I received it uh, you know, in the mail. I remember just holding it. It was just, it was, it felt almost like it was warm and had so much Shakti in it. Matt Kahn's work. Uh, Mary Shutan has a great book called The Spiritual Awakening Guide. Um, one day I found myself at the bookstore, almost just in the flow. My hand reaches up to the shelf, pull this off the shelf, and it's vibrating in my hands. Really powerful book as well. Um, Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now, for example, I opened that book up and it was just like this whoosh of energy washing over me. Um, so uh, Tao Te Ching, all these types of texts, any text that's written from a place of a very high advanced flow of, of Shakti to the system, it will be, you know, entered into the artwork, the writing, the book, the music, whatever it is. And those that are in a receptive place will once again, pick up on it. Okay. So Shakti is not just from an individual, like an Indian yoga guru, right? A photo can also transmit Shakti. Um, uh, Tawny Todd, great friend of mine. She was on my channel. She describes uh, seeing a picture of this, uh, you know, this old Indian guy in the in sort of a, like a gift shop, and then she gets this huge, you know, uh, surge of, of shakti. You could say it really touches her. This picture, something like that. I may be a little off on the details of her experience. Um, anyway, she finds out that this is Ramana Maharshi's picture. Um, not unheard of at all. Of course, Ramana Maharshi, very palpable energy field. Look at any of his photos. You can Google them right now. You can see in his eyes, even though it's an old, you know, low res sort of black and white photo, 
he's he's in a very very deep state of consciousness and his field is radiating and you can see it in those photos you can pick up on it in those photos as well i had a friend of mine she saw a picture of a tibetan goddess it was like a sort of drawing not even a photo it was like a drawing saw this and had this huge you know surge of of a transmission in which i guess some sort of ener energetic transmission she's had a sort of past life recall she kind of recognized you know that she has some relationship with this you know tibetan tibetan uh, goddess this deity um, interesting things like that of course this is you know we're talking about divine universal consciousness there's no limits here right uh, we can also receive shaktipat transmissions in dreams and uh, the effects are very real and they will carry over into our waking life so dreams are not just dreams are not just hallucinations we have at night Dreams are very, very uh, potent grounds for very serious spiritual development to take place. So this can happen in dreams as well. Maybe you've experienced this. Um, keep in mind, we are going through an ascension. The universe doesn't uh, have, hasn't given us time to go out and find a guru and, and receive a transmission from them. No, now the gurus come to us and they come through in the form of all sorts of guides, deities, um, ascended masters, they come to you at night at times, and it's a very valid experience. And you will notice that the effects will carry over into your waking life for years to come. So we don't just dismiss these experiences as, oh, that was just a dream. No, 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 no. Very valid experiences. Very valid experiences. So I had a, a couple dreams here I can mention, and then I'm going to invite some others to share. Um, in one dream, I was in a sort of floating yoga studio. It was like a circular yoga studio. And there was a really radiant woman. And she said, okay, we're going to get ready for the transmission now. And out of the floor emerged a big uh, head of Shiva. And that head of Shiva was just radiating this sort of like electricity. So I received a sort of transmission from this head of Shiva. Shiva, of course, being uh, the masculine deity. Um I had another experience where in, uh, in a dream, this, this is after a sort of the major Kundalini rising that all of this began to take place for me. But in a, another dream, I had this sort of a hippie woman type lady. She gave me a, a pink piece of paper. I held it. She said, okay, give it back to me now. So I gave it back to her. She said, okay, thank you so much. And then she put her finger on the bridge of my nose and just began massaging the bridge of my nose. And it was extremely blissful. I went into ecstasy. I went into this deep meditative state. The entire experience turned into static. My body turned into just total static, kind of like what you may see on a, on a TV, uh, that white snow type static. And I woke up in that state. I woke up out of sleeping into this meditative state, total, uh, totally in a, in a field of static. And uh, it was like a sort of samadhi type, deep type meditative experience. And like I said, it translated over into my waking life after I'd woken up from sleep, right? So it's, it affected my consciousness in this way. So I think that the, re the significance of the piece of paper was that it was a form of payment. So she knew I didn't have anything. She said, okay, I'll give you something. Now you give it back to me. So there's an energy exchange there somewhat. And then of course, she, she gave me the, uh, the, the Shakti pot uh, experience. So you may, you may uh, note that... Um, Traditionally, it's not always, but sometimes there is a sort of energy a reciprocity as part of the, uh, the, the exchange of, of these teachings of Shakti and whatnot, uh, though not always, not always. Um, as well, you, you can have encounters uh, in, in dreams with living teachers, with dead teachers. I had, a, I had a dream with Ramana Maharshi, again, appeared before me in a dream, and uh, he just laughed. There was a little bit more to it, another topic for another time, but... Uh, towards the end of the dream, he just looked at me and just laughed and laughed. And I just began crying, crying hysterically in this dream. I've other, other dreams with um, the presence of like uh, Ananda Mai Ma, another great saint, uh, no longer in her body. As well, we can have uh, mystical experiences. So not necessarily sleeping, but maybe we're in meditation, um, a sort of uh, psychic phenomena in which maybe we with our third eye are able to perceive uh, a figure, an entity, a deity appear before us and offer Shaktipa. So this is not uncommon at all. Like I said, we don't have time to go find a guru, go find a teacher. Sometimes they come to us now, they may appear in your room at night and give you a blast of Shakti. And it's, it's, you know, incredible experience. I just had a conversation with Julie Hoyle 
on my channel, she describes receiving Shaktipat in this way from a particular guru, Bhagwan Nityananda of Ganesh, excuse me, Bhagwan Nityananda of Ganesh Puri. And uh, she's not the only one that, that I've encountered who actually received a, a transmission from this, this dead yoga guru um, in a mystical experience. Um, so I can describe my most recent mystical experience receiving Shaktipat. So I was on retreat um, and uh, having a lot of Kundalini phenomena, a very active uh, Kundalini on this retreat. And I was really loving it. It's a bit of attachment, you could say. I have some attachment to the phenomena, you could say. But I just totally love this process. Even the dark, difficult, challenging, painful parts, I love it. I love every aspect of it. And um, so for a few days, I've just got this rumbling, kind of like there's a kitten purring in my heart, or there's like a Harley Davidson kind of kind of rumbling in my heart. And it's just going on for a few days. Anyway, I go to sleep and uh, I'm awoken in the middle of the night. And this, this rumbling is now rumbling at like the, like kind of like a, like the Harley Davidson engine is like full force in my chest. And it does not uncomfortable. It's just this huge rumbling. And I, I wake up and just to give you a sense of my attitude towards this process, I wake up and I say, Oh yeah, hell yeah. Like this, this Harley Davidson engine is rumbling. This is cool. I like this. Let's see what's going to happen. And I'm just totally in a state of surrender, you know, bring it on. Whatever is happening, the phenomena, none of it scares me. I, I'm totally surrendered to this process. In the corner of my room, about three inches tall is Ram Das. Obviously, uh, he, he died a few years ago, Ram Das, fantastic spiritual teacher. He's about three inches tall. From up high, he throws a lightning bolt. It, it, lands on the back of my neck stabs the back of my neck and suddenly i'm getting electrified like shocked in the most pleasant way but very intense but very pleasant and in this experience here i'm shown two new ways to give shaktipat um which i don't think it's necessary and i don't feel ready to, to share that with others right now but uh i'm, I'm also still, like I said, not giving active Shaktipat um, in any way, um, despite being shown these two new ways on top of the, the, the first way I learned uh, in 2019. Um, and so I'm getting blasted with the, the Shakti and shown these two new ways. And then I receive this download of uh, uh, the two words. The first words that come to me are Kundalini Awareness. And I understood immediately, I have to create, of course, uh, kundaliniawareness.org. And in over the course of the next couple hours, I was wide awake, super electrified. I began to just receive the, uh, the, the guidance, the, the instructions, the, the ideas, the downloads of how to set up kundaliniawareness.org. So that's the origins of, of my new project, kundaliniawareness.org. Um, of course, goes without saying, it's to raise awareness about this phenomenon. That's why I'm here doing this. The idea behind kundaliniawareness.org is that there is a collection of stories of individuals that have had kundalini experience, like all of you, all of yourselves. So um, please submit your stories. The idea is to create a catalog so that others can find this material and say, ah, I'm not the only one. I had something similar happen to me. So that researchers can look and see that there's similar themes and that they can see that we're not all crazy. As well, we have a directory of licensed mental health professionals, psychologists, psychotherapists, psychiatrists, social workers um, that have Kundalini experience themselves that are able to support others going through the process in, of course, um, a, a professional way. And so uh, if you happen to be a licensed mental health professional with Kundalini experience, please submit an application to the directory. We'd love to tell people about you and your work. And uh, of course, to get you to support others because we, know we, need, we all need some support. As well, there will be a, a new sort of a, a podcast at some point in the future. We'll be working on some trainings um, for those that say are, are a counselor saying, hey, I'm, I, I want to know how can I support my, my uh, clients that are having spiritual phenomena, Kundalini awakening experiences? What can I do? So we're putting together some trainings and whatnot. Um, and it'll take some time for all this to come together. I was also shown in this time to uh, organize the largest global meditation for Kundalini, the world has ever seen. So that will take place in two years, March, 2026. We will be gathering on live on YouTube, just like how we are here. We'll meditate together from all around the world. 
to get the Shakti field really flowing. So that's, of course, um, um, you know, we all can benefit from it. So I was given the date um, two years down the road because this is a serious big project. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some momentum. It's going to rely on all of you to uh, you know, spread the word about kundaliniawareness.org. Not necessarily so much about me, Brent Spirit, not that important, but kundaliniawareness.org. That is our collective creation. And that's our tool that we're going to use to uh, support one another and support all those other people that are out there that are going through this far out stuff that have no idea what it's called. They have no idea whether they've completely lost their minds, they're struggling, they're challenged. And, um, you know, that's how we're going to do it. It's going to take some time. You're going to think very long term, 10, 20, 30 years. Okay. So, um, We'll wrap it up there on uh, my points. Now I'm going to turn it over to you. I know I've shared a lot here. Thank you so much for, for hanging in with me so far. So we'll take some, some shares about Shaktipat. I want to hear about your experiences. If you've got questions, I'll do my best to answer, but I want to open the floor up for others to also uh, share some insights as well to support one another. Thank you so much. So we'll go over here to YR and see what YR has for us today. Hey, hey how you doing? Hey, not too bad. Um, yeah, I, uh, basically I'm, I'm definitely not talking to boast or anything, but, uh, I had an experience basically in the past few days and I don't, if it's okay, I'd like to just share it because, uh, this is all new to me. Everything you're even mentioning right now, I, I don't understand, but it's, uh, it's it's overwhelming and uh i just thought i'd uh share what happened please so basically i'm i'm in i'm in the jewish world i'm religious that's and it's kind of looks down on me that that i would be maybe pursuing this because it's not popular so uh but i i was I basically even had a jesus ex experience you know uh, born again years ago and that was changed my whole life and uh, I've been studying and praying for years now and I've been reading about Jewish meditation and these things and learning about in the Torah the pineal gland you know and and things would pop up it's even in the Jewish texts and stuff like this so Basically, last week, I uh, started to basically experiment just doing some meditation, listening to like binaural beats and even breathing. I had no idea really how powerful this stuff was, kind of just focusing on my third eye. I didn't want anything to do with Kundalini. I don't know if that's what's going on with me. But um, because even in the Jewish meditation, I have this book that talks about how we're supposed to bring down the energy, not up like Kundalini. And in the Jewish texts, we in prayers, we do bowing to curve the spine, stuff like this. So anyway, I started uh, doing these meditations and I was just getting into it but i didn't think anything was happening like i would watch videos saying oh you will be able to tap in your third eye you'll see colors this and that i didn't see nothing but the breathing was very powerful and when i uh stopped doing the the breathing and the, the meditations i had a pulsing in between my eyes and then i started to do my prayers as well we read in uh, in in judaism from the the book called the sadura prayer book and as I was reading the verses, my brain, my whole brain started tingling. And I've been getting now, and it just wouldn't stop. And I've been getting headaches on the left side of my, my head, very extreme headaches and, uh, and feeling pressure on my forehead, hot and cold. And I just feel like my head is kind of heavy and I'm not, I, I, I can't ex describe what's going on with me, but I feel uneasy. And, and, and I'm just <laughs> wondering if you're, you're, if this is common or what's going on with me, because it was really intense. Yeah. 
Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for sharing, YR. And um, yeah. yeah, I empathize with you. Like you shared, you know, you, you, you're new to these experiences and uh, it can be uh, quite challenging, but hopefully now that you're at least have this word Kundalini, you can uh, start to put some of the pieces together. And I think that's the direction you're headed in. Um, like we were sharing earlier in the context of, of Shaktipat, which is, you know, one particular topic on this path, we can invite the energy of God, which is all around. God isn't limited to just one particular place. God is all around. So we can actually invite that energy into our system to flow through us. And uh, through deep prayer, through deep devotion, and, and with the intention to connect with God, we can actually have that prayer answered. And it's, it's typically... Um, it's always going to blow us away and be nothing like we thought. Um, this is just the, the power of God, right? And so through, through intense devotion and intense dedicated prayer, um, the energy begins to flow. And uh, the path of, of Judaism, um, maybe not mainstream Judaism, but more uh, uh, contemplative, uh, Mystical Judaism, the energy flow of God is 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 there. Um, the term you can look up, but maybe if you don't already know, is uh, Shekinah or Shekinah. I'm not sure yeah. how to pronounce it, but that refers to the indwelling yeah. of God, the indwelling of God in the human body, right? Um, and so uh, mm -hmm. this is what you're experiencing here. Now, within Judaism, from what I understand, for ex and I may be wrong and please correct me but from what i understand there is this idea of of with the uh i believe it's the the yarmulke the, the hat on the crown is to remind one that god is above right and so within the 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 right. western traditions there's this idea of the descent of shakti the descent of grace the, the descent of say within christianity it's the holy spirit it comes from above downwards um Whereas in the East, there's this idea of Kundalini dwells at the base of the spine and it rises up. Um, now, the way that I see it is that these are just two different paradigms describing the same process. It's just that um, some maybe become fixated on one particular idea and they say, well, no, no, only Kundalini can rise from the base. That's it. It says that in this text, my guru said this. I had the experience that rises from the from the from the base of the spine. That's the only experience of Kundalini. Anything different is not true. It's not real. It's something else. I don't think that's the correct approach or attitude. I feel that this is a universal energy flow that's all around. And like we shared earlier about how I can ex how one can experience the transmission across time and space, it's because this is not limited to time and space. So up from the base of the spine to the top of the head down from the top of the head into the rest of the body, God is flowing in all directions, not limited to any one particular um, um, way of moving. And so mm -hmm. you can approach this path through many different traditions. Um, and, and you can be quite flexible if you feel called, though you don't necessarily need to be. There are many um, great um, uh, Jewish people that have had powerful awakening experiences um for example like i spoke about ram das um or originally richard alpert he was a harvard psychologist um jewish had all these sorts of spiritual experiences happen to him went over to india connected deeply with the traditions of india um but if you listen to Ram Dass's teachings, they're universal. He's not speaking about one, from one particular tradition or approach. He's speaking from, from, from a universal place. And ultimately, um, what I can, can leave you with is, say, for example, no cultures have been formed yet on the planet. There are just humans all around. There's people in South America. There's people in Australia. There's people in Africa. There's people in Europe. Everywhere. If spiritual transformation and the next stage in an individual's evolution is possible. And it involves an energetic uh, transformation of the human body, the human system. If that's possible, well, then it's going to happen to people all over the world. It's going to happen in Australia. It's going to happen in Africa. It's going to happen in South America. 
can happen in India, everywhere. But they're going to then come up with their own language to describe it. They're going to come up with their own systems to describe it. They're going to come up with their own culture around it. They're going to practice it in different ways. If one key individual says, well, this process began for me at the top of my head, and he's the one who writes the book, then people are going to say, oh, okay. This guy had some great, great powers. He was, you know, pretty powerful person. And he wrote that it happens at the top of the head. So it must happen in that way for me. Whereas on the other side of the world, somebody will say, you know, something different. And so what happens is people get caught up in, in the, the descriptions, the culture around it and fail to see that this is actually a universal phenomena happening all over the world. Right. And so this is just what we're experiencing here. And I think at this point in our culture, we're so blessed that we can actually tune into the teachings from mystical Judaism, from the Kabbalah, from yoga, from Buddhism, from Christianity, from the psychedelic uh, uh, approach as well. All of these, all of these from the shaman, shamanistic approach, all of these traditions are speaking about the same uh, universal human transformation and evolution of consciousness in their own way. And so um, by all means, you can pick a path. And, and uh, if you follow the systems, generally speaking, I know it's there in Judaism. The, all, the, the full system is there if you follow through with it. The mystical tradition is there. But perhaps you may be called to be a little bit more flexible. I know you mentioned you had an experience with Jesus. Maybe a little bit uh, you're being invited to be a bit more flexible. Um, so just some ideas there. But you keep exploring and trust that this energy flow within you is the energy of God. It's going to support you. It's going to guide you through the process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. And actually, even what you're saying is it kind of lines up with Kabbalah, like even the concepts. And, you know, we put on tefillin in the morning, which is above our head, the kippa and everything. I, I realize that, yeah, the yamaka means the fear of God over you. But um, I'm just wondering, just one last thing, like, so I'm just wondering, is this going to accelerate or how do I keep it calm? Like, because it is it is very powerful. So is there a way where I can calm this down? Yeah. So, um, surrender to God, trust God, say, look, I give it all up to you. Guide me, show me, teach me, uh, lead me to the right books, the right videos, the right people, the right conversations inwardly. You may be taught, uh, so you surrender in that way as a student, as a humble student. Um, and then, uh, focusing on self-care, focusing on self-care, eating well, walking, moving your body. Very important because it's a full body transformation right? Full body transformation. Prior to this happening to me, I thought religion was just something in people's heads. I thought it was just philosophical. I thought it was just about contemplating. No, this actually has to do with the energy flow of God surging through the entire nervous system head to toe. And so we must uh, take care of the body in, in, in the best ways that we can. So um, that can help you to keep it from getting uh, too over, over uh, energized at times as well. Create a container where, you know, um, you spend time at the end of your day, dedicate to, you know, surrendering to gentle prayer, um, to whatever's coming up, creating a container will allow you to have intense experiences, but within that container, within that window of time, if we don't have a container, then it kind of can start to happen. You know, when we're like, you know, at work and stuff, we can have really intense energetic phenomena, but if we create a container every day and go there consistently to practice, to pray, whatever it is, it tends to then, you know, um, be limited to that, that safe uh, space, which can help us navigate uh, worldly life at the same time. So I hope that helps. Why thanks for sharing so openly. And um, I wish you all the best uh, moving ahead on your journey. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. Okay. So we'll go over to Shri B here. Uh, hello, Brian. Um, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's good to connect with you. I'm good. Um, uh, thank you so much uh, for what you are doing because I have found your website and your YouTube channel very recently, a month or so. And um, I'm very much impressed um, because whatever I'm going to right now is resonating with what, whatever you said already in the website. Because um, I would like to share my experience. Yes. It, it might take a little bit of time. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, please share. I found some spiritual guru, famous spiritual guru in the internet, and I resonated very much with his teaching and all. Um, and two years back, I got initiated into his, uh, um, like, you know, some Kriya Yoga. Um, and then uh, since then, I started uh, experiencing this uh, energetic phenomena because my whole life I was uh, kind of agnostic. 
I, I, I'm not kind of believer type person. Um, so, but since it started this energetical phenomena, um, it's quite uh, surprising for me. And also, and I found everywhere on the internet, but I found you only your, your uh, channel is resonating more with my, whatever I'm going through right now. So uh, for past few years, almost like a, like a nearly 10 years, I was into this self-inquiry with Ramana Maharshi and various sources we can find on internet. And, and for, uh, as I said before, uh, two years back, I was initiated into this uh, um, by this guru. And last year I attended an event. Uh, some It's like uh, um, a session with him. I don't know if it is, if you can call it Shakti Path or, or something else. I was in his presence for three sessions, like three days or something. But uh, since then, or even before that, I started uh, experiencing this energetical phenomena, like magnetic sensation on my forehead. Whenever I visit a Devi temple, especially feminine temple, it's like a magnetic pull towards the deity. It's only to that direction uh, between my eyebrows. And then slowly, uh, this energetical phenomena started intensifying. Um, like, you know, I started experiencing this strong energy pouring down on my forehead, like forehead, not only forehead, on the top of my head, Agnet, where uh, Sahasra is. I don't know if uh, these terms are quite new because I never know about Kundalini and all. I have no idea until I started experiencing them. So um, I don't know if, you, if I can even call it as a top down awakening or I, I have no word, but some, uh, I don't even know if if my if I received Shakti path from a guru. Most probably, yes, because the it was initiation. But I want to know is what is, is the difference between grace of the guru that is guiding, purging, purifying your system and trying to because I am strongly uh, emotionally in every way connected to him because I was my his teachings and everything is resonating very much with me. So is this the grace, his grace working through me or is it, was it my efforts and sadhana that I was doing? Because every day I'm, I'm doing like half an hour or so meditation, including breathing exercises, everything, whatever taught by them. Is this uh, even Kundali awakening or spiritual awakening or whatever is going on? Because it's my everyday experience. It happens randomly during different, different times. But sometimes these, sometimes you know, the energy is so intense that if I go to uh, towards a group of people where the group of people are located, I can feel like my head is squishing because the energy is so much concentrated uh, near my agna chakra, and there was so much pull towards that. I don't know what exactly is going on. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the pressure is too much, and it's hard for me to focus on whatever I'm doing on computer. And and so sometimes I can feel like water like thing is dripping on my top of my head once in a while, not always. Yeah. And uh, yeah, all these things are happening. I, yeah. Okay. Most... I, I, I can't articulate properly because I'm totally new. To no, this you, experience. you've articulated it perfectly well. Thank you. Yeah. And this is, oh, you. this is definitely Kundalini awakening that you're going through. I don't know what mm -hmm. else it would be. Um, and typically only those that are really uh, either in the, in the thick of this experience or on the brink of it, find their way over to a meeting like this. Um, but this is definitely Kundalini awakening that you're experiencing. Um, so your effort, or is it the guru's grace? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't operate uh, from the paradigm of, of a guru. I'm just a spiritual teacher sharing what I can, starting some conversations. Okay, so I'll lead with that. But I'm familiar, generally speaking, with, you know, these ideas of a, a, a guru disciple type of relationship. And so the guru's grace, because you have a connection with the guru, you recognize that this is somebody who can support you, that they are uh, in, in a very high state, and you can trust them, their grace is making its way to you, but it doesn't only um have an impact on you because of the guru mm -hmm. it has an impact on you also because of your surrender and cooperation and collaboration with the guru's grace 
So this is where your effort comes in. The grace is coming towards you, but you have to do something with it. You have to get out of the way. You have to surrender to it. You have to cooperate with it. And that is what you've been doing. So it's a collaborative approach here. Okay. So it's not one or the other, your sadhana, your practice, you know, you've been practicing uh, regularly, continue with that and know that this is how you actually accept the grace of the guru and make use of it. So those who don't practice and don't put in their own work, who don't collaborate with the process, the guru's grace doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't do anything. It's a collaborative mm -hmm. effort. Okay. And we keep in mind here as well, that the guru's grace is not the individual human being. They are just the costume within which the divine is presenting itself in a way that you find most uh, acceptable in a way that you can relate with in the best way for you. That's what it is. So it's not that we attribute uh, all of it to the, the flesh human being calling themselves the guru. It's what's coming through the guru, which is the grace of God, which is no different than, um, you know, like we were speaking with YR earlier, he was praying and he experienced the grace of God. For some, they pray in solitude, they experience, you know, the blessing and they go through this process. Others connect with somebody else who calls themselves a guru and they begin to go through the process. So many different interesting ways. Not every way is for everybody, but there's a way for for each of us, of course, and perhaps you found your way, but you practice and know that the grace is there. It's, it's just, you have to collaborate with it and cooperate with it. The difficulties that you're experiencing are not unheard of at all. Pressure in the head, feeling, you know, like there's water dripping, all, all pretty standard type of experiences that not everybody has, but um, doesn't surprise me that you're having them at all. Continue with your practices in time. Things will stabilize. Uh, you may have some emotional stuff coming up. It's okay. Allow it to be there. There's nothing wrong with feeling any intense emotions, nothing wrong at all. You just hold space for them, practice with them, meditate with them. And in time, you'll find yourself in a, in a stable place, um, in a completely new place, completely, you know, reborn and transformed. Okay. So, so thank you so much for sharing with us. Uh, I appreciate that. Shri B. Molly here is talking about transmission and radiating. So she says, my friend radiates it. And he said, I do too. It's very magnetic. We've both been magnetizing people like crazy unintentionally or at least some kind of Kundalini energy. Yeah. So Molly's sharing here about a sort of passive transmission. This is what I mean. It just happens. Once the energy begins flowing through you, the nervous system just naturally begins to radiate and, and um, very interesting stuff here. Very interesting stuff. Thanks for sharing, Molly. Red Pill Queen says, I accidentally gave a kundalini shakti transmission to my dentist. If you're activated, I think people touching you can receive transmission. Yes, yes, but they must be in a position where they are, uh, you know, it's their time on the path. Otherwise, like I said, you know, everybody would have had a, a transmission, right? Everybody would just pass it along, right? Like the flu or something. So uh, Shiv says a, has an interesting question here. Recalling back to what I shared earlier, Hearing that giving Shaktipat is not an advanced ability is very new to me. What is an advanced ability? Well, you got me there, Shiv. But what's coming to me to respond is there are no advanced abilities. Okay? Let that sink in. There are no advanced abilities. They all can occur at very early stages of the spiritual journey, in fact, including Shaktipat, all the abilities, all the cities, all the gifts. Shaktipat, of course, can appear to be a very advanced ability because, you know, somebody's walking around saying, I'm a guru, touch you on the forehead, look you in the eye, you have a whole energetic transmission. You may think, wow, this person must be so advanced. But uh, I don't think any, any abilities, any demonstrations of any abilities is, is not an indication of how advanced somebody is on the path. So we must use discernment and we must not get arrogant about ourselves too. If we get cities, if we get abilities, doesn't mean that we are super advanced. That's what's coming to me. But great question, great question. Lisa's sharing here. So can I potentially give it to my partner? He does not believe in it, but what I've noticed is he is shaking at night when he sleeps as well. 
He's been falling off, feeling off mentally. And lastly, he's been experiencing a lot of emotional stuff coming up. Yes, Lisa, very interesting stuff here. So it's not impossible for uh, him to be going through, uh, you know, a Kundalini awakening, especially considering that he's your partner. Um, however, not everybody who's going through a Kundalini awakening will have their partner also go through it. I'll, I'll, I'll put it that way. But it sounds like he's going through something here. Um, at night, you know, shaking, he goes into a state of non-resistance, a little bit more open and receptive. The energy can do its work, um, despite him not necessarily believing it or, or being cooperative with the process. Um, yeah, a lot of emotional stuff can come up. That's very common with Kundalini as well. Um, if you say gave it to him or transmitted it to him, like I said earlier, it's because he was in a position to, uh, to be ready for this process now, though he may even not be openly acknowledging that he's ready. The spirit, the soul, the higher self, the Kundalini Shakti, the intelligence knows when each individual is, is ready for what they need in this lifetime. So not everybody goes through the full process in the most intense way in this lifetime. Some people get a little bit of a very gradual experience, um, you know, and, and they make it to a very, very uh, uh, deep states of consciousness, but some just have a bit of a, a dose in this lifetime. The next lifetime they pick up, do a little bit more. So you can keep that in mind as well. So we don't want to also compare too much about my process with my partner's process and think that they're going to look similarly similar in intensity. It may look very different, but it sounds like he's probably going through it. But at the same time, you know, shaking, being emotional could be a lot of different things too. So, you know, keep an eye on him. Yes, hi there. Well, first of all, thank you so much. I would really like to thank you for this work that you do. It's absolutely amazing and beautiful um, that you are giving, you know, all of us like this opportunity to ask any questions that we may have and um, just have a platform where we can talk about these topics that are just not so, um, you know, easy to talk about just with anyone, you know, around us, unfortunately. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, um, so now I, I guess my question is, and I know you did mention it also in the beginning of the, um, of this, um, uh, this podcast um, that just to be a little careful from where you are getting the Shakti parts or um, the energy transmission. So I was just, I guess my question is like, can this be harmful um, or can this be um, impacting someone negatively if I don't necessarily know, um, as you had mentioned, like, you know, how much work they've done, the people that are actually giving the Shakti about how much work they've done or what is left for them, which of course I, I would know, you know. Yeah. Um, so. Okay. Well, well, thank you for, for sharing, Sarika. Um, generally speaking, those who give Shaktipat, we're not so concerned with the quality of their transmission because that is the Shakti. Right. That's the Shakti. When, when I say that we should be a little concerned with uh, you know, who's giving it, it's to ensure that we don't give all our power away to an individual who may you know, abuse us or take advantage of us or promise us things that they aren't able to uh, fulfill. Um, that's where we should be very mindful. And what happens in some situations is people are very vulnerable. They maybe are, are somewhat... Um, impressionable they see somebody's you know got all sorts of very energy very uh you know, all sorts of energetic capabilities this man must mean that i can you know trust them completely and fully and uh so that's my my essentially my warning is that keep in mind that just because somebody can transmit doesn't mean they've done all the work per se um so you listen to your gut when things don't feel right you leave or you don't end up there in the first place um, and uh, uh, practice boundaries, etc. As well, we need to understand that even though the awakened kundalini may be flowing through our system, we can still receive a Shaktipat transmission from a guru, from a teacher, from a sort of mystical experience, and it can quite literally help us on our process. However, it shouldn't be seen as a supplement. Sorry, it shouldn't be seen as a replacement for our own spiritual work. Some people think that, oh, I'll just keep going, get, going to get Shaktipat without doing any of my own work. And that's how I'll become enlightened and I'll heal and become, you know, 
in a state of, of yoga, say of union with God without doing any of my own work. No, we, we have to do our own work as well. So that's something to keep in mind because what I find is that many people um, kind of get addicted to Shaktipat experiences. They keep going and going and going 10, 20 times, but uh, perhaps their, their individual sadhana is, is a little bit uh, you know, lacking. So these are some ideas to keep in mind. Um, I hope that can help you. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I do have one more question, if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the last time when I was sitting with, uh, you know, with my meditation and I, I felt the Shakti, I, I remember like feeling in this really amazing state and place, but then a question arise in my mind and I was, I, I'm, like, I'm a little bit confused with this question because uh, the, the question is like, well, what's the purpose of, of you know rising this shakti in, in in one's body like what is the purpose for this what is the um yeah basically what is the purpose of doing this yeah so uh, we can say the purpose is to have a direct union with the divine so the sense of separation begins to fall away as a result of this awakening process of this energy of the Shakti. Um, we enter into a state of oneness. And from this place of oneness, there is a, a natural sense of peace. It's a natural sense of unconditional love. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be perfect per se. It can come and go because this human vessel, this human body has its own limitations um, in terms of the energy flow that it can experience. But the goal, the aim is to come out of separation and live in the truth that we are all one, all interconnected, not only as individuals, but all of reality is one thing. It's just manifesting in apparently multiple forms. But through this process, we, we uh, move through separation and that brings us to a state of union with everything, which of course is God because God is everything. So that's where it's taking us. Um, and, and many of us may get glimpses now and then at times, um, through experiences like like Shaktipat, it can give those glimpses. So thank you so much, Sarika. I really appreciate your your sharing and, and some great questions. Hey, Brent, how's it going, man? Hey, Shiv, it's going good. All right, so to honor your request, I'll share really briefly my experience with Shaktipat and energy transmission and all that kind of stuff. So I'm 34 right now. When I was around I, I think i was 20 i did some real soul searching within and i prayed to god and i asked god to you know show me he's real or you know stuff like that so eventually i ended up um falling into the hands of these really awesome people in virginia beach uh virginia beach is known as like a big spiritual hub uh in, in the u.s i think so um these people they called themselves um quantum touch healers and it was an older crowd right um you know like 50 plus 50 to like 70 uh whatever and um they would just put their hands on you and they would they would transmit energy and i you can imagine i was i was 20 um i had gone through a lot of illnesses in my life i had cancer i also had like severe mental illness like i was diagnosed schizophrenia and shit like that so I, I had some very profound spiritual inquiry like where is all this coming from i'm a good person why am i experiencing all this so what these these they call themselves the happy healers they put their hands over me and i could feel energy moving through me and and uh it was profound for me because for the first time in my life i experienced that god is real that 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 that, that there is a god so uh, this eventually um led to me learning things about healing. I got really into that. Eventually I got into meditation, you know, the whole like spiritual gamut um, of what everything that you could learn from the internet, right? F about spirituality. Um, so, okay. So I became kind of proficient, I guess, in like a, in like, like a, a kind of, maybe I'm bragging, but you know, healing and stuff like that. I became kind of, kind of really good at it. Like, I used to do it on people and whatnot. So eventually this um, evolved into me um, getting a little glimpse of like what, what Shaktipat is. Um, 
So my first time hearing that word, I used to play Counter Strike. If you heard of that, I used oh, yeah, to play Counter Strike. <laughs> yeah, so I had this one buddy, right? When I was in college, I used to play a lot of Counter Strike. I didn't, I didn't like school. So this one buddy I used to play Counter Strike with, he was all the way in Virginia. I was in Maryland. So he t- tells me how spiritual he got. He's also Indian, you know. He's Gujarati from the same part of India as myself. Um, I was born in America though. Anyways, um, so he tells me how how spiritual he got and whatnot, and he mentioned Shakti Pot. So I was like curious about that. I didn't know what it was coming from. I, at at this time, I was in college. I was getting into Sufism. Um, I even converted to Islam, bro. Like this, the 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 allure of Sufism it it drew me in so much that I secretly you know without telling my family and all that that i you know i converted to islam i started you know learning the namaz salat you know the full gamut so i was mixing around doing a lot of things at once um this buddy of mine he tells me about shakti you know i stayed in my mind i didn't really know what it was going to lead to eventually you know i started doing more meditation and blah 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 and stuff like that i, I kind of become so full of it that i stopped taking this medicine that i have to take it's not psychiatric, it's actually hormonal, it's for the thyroid, right? So eventually I thought that, you know, I can heal myself, God is with me, blah, blah, blah. So I stopped taking that shit, right? And um, I experienced really bad psychosis, like straight up schizophrenic symptoms. And I, I personally thought that, you know, I was right, everybody was wrong, but they would tell me, you know, you need to get back on your medicine. Look, you, you're not right. You know, this shit kind of continued on and off all throughout my 20s, I would just stop taking it. You know, at one point, I stopped taking it. And I broke the law. I ended up in prison. Um, So I got a federal sentence. I was in federal prison for a few years. Um, when I was in federal prison, right? Check this out. Um, okay, so I, I was like by the music room, you know, hang out, play guitar, whatever. Uh, there was this one dude who was kind of a hippie. I could relate to him, right? He wasn't a hardened con, like, you know, 90%, maybe not 90, maybe about 60 to 70% of the people are hardened cons, you know, to some extent. This guy seemed like, you know, he was a hippie turned, he was, he was kind of a hippie who broke bad. So I asked him if he knew about meditation and stuff. He says, not really, but he has a friend who's into that. So I'm walking out the chow hall one day and this old white guy, you know, he doesn't look friendly. He tells me, you know, he's been in prison his whole life, blah, blah, He approaches me. And being in prison, when somebody approaches you like that in prison, like, you're going to be on a high alert. Like, <laughs> maybe I offended somebody somehow. I don't know what's going on. But he, this old white guy, right, Southern accent, he asked me if I knew about meditation. I'm like, okay. Okay, so obviously the guitar guy told him about me. So this, okay, so this guy now, his name's Earl, by the way. He's, he's telling me he has a guru. And he, he he meditates and he asked me if I know about Shaktipat. So I'm like, oh my God. Uh, you know, I ended up in prison now. Somebody's telling me about Shaktipat in here. Like, I told him, yeah, I've been studying that stuff since I was a kid. You know, since I was in my, like, early 20s. And um, he tells me, you know, about his guru and whatnot. And how he does... Um... Am, I, am I rambling, by the way? Is it cool? No, you have, you have no time? I'm... I'm... Glued. Intrigued? Intrigued. Okay, so um, so this guy, Earl, he puts me onto this meditation program. It's called Siddha Yoga. You've heard of it, obviously. Um, so I get really excited. I'm like, oh, shit, you know, I'm in prison for a real reason. It wasn't because of the, whatever crime I did, whatever. So I get really excited. Um, he shows me the program. You know, it's the full moon. He's really excited to tell me about it. He gives me some introductory material. So now I start practicing this stuff kind of like an insane person like i do it to a t you know i meditate for one hour even though it hurts i hate doing it you know i follow all the practices um i keep doing it for a while for a while for a while um so so like at times it'll put me in really transcendent states but you gotta imagine i'm still very naive eventually i meet a bad guy in prison he was like a bad spiritual guy right he follows a left-handed path. So he tells me, you know, stop taking your medicine. I'm like, okay. So I stopped taking it, right? This guy's really bad, by the way. He he, he clearly has said these. Um, he follows a left-handed path. So he's into like devil worship, you know, occultic bad guy material. He shows me this stuff. I'm naive. 
he showed me some Sydneys that really freaked me out. I was really impressed by him. He, he wanted me to call him master at times. I kind of called him master, but not like in a very reverent way, kind of in a joking way. Anyways, you know, he, he has all these occultic books and I read them. I thought, you know, every it's all one, you know, let me just go ahead and read this stuff. You know, transcendent experiences start to happen and whatnot. But he told me to get off my medicine. Right? So I started freaking out, you know, back to, you know, what would usually happen to me. But I still meditate and stuff like that. Eventually, I had a fallout with this guy. Uh, we just stopped getting along, right? He's kind of crazy. One guy called him Little Hitler, right? <laughs> anyway, he, he wasn't even white, though. He was... um. He was black. He was he had, was like half Asian and stuff, and stuff like that. Anyways, I keep following my meditation program, uh, the Siddha Yoga, um, to a T. I'm off my medicine now, so I'm following it like a crazy person. You know, I called my family on the phone, and they could tell that something was up with me. They wanted me to get back on my medicine. I tell them, no, I'm not doing that. You know, I, I think, you know, I'm healed and whatnot. So eventually, I move into a self, a different guy. I get him on meditation, the Siddha Yoga program, and we're both following the, the Siddha Yoga meditation program. And things are like probably the most peaceful they've ever been in my life in prison. So eventually this new guy, um, he ends up following some occult stuff I, again, right? So he follows like Luciferian stuff and I, I'm still naive. At the time, you know, I felt like the devil was attacking me. I didn't know what was going on, but I was like, let me follow what he's following. And then things things got really bad. Like my mental state just collapsed, right? I'm absolutely crazy. <laughs> People know me as the, the crazy dude, right? Uh anyways, um I end up in another dude cell. But around this time, I gave up meditation altogether. I'm like, I cannot handle all this shit. I end up in another dude cell. And this guy is absolutely batshit insane. And at some point, I think he's trying to kill me. Um, like I said earlier, at some point, I, you know, accepted Islam as a religion, as my religion. And I tell it to him, like, in a friendly way. Like, I told him, yeah, I'm not into it anymore. He's still into it. And now he wants to kill me because I left it. <laughs> I'm so scared. <laughs> so I remember one time, I was sitting down in, in, in the chair, in my chair in the cell, and he's yelling at me. I'm not sure what's going to happen. He's going to try to kill me or something. Uh, but... I was very terrified. I thought he was going to kill me, you know. And I experienced the Kundalini phenomenon going on. Keep in mind, I stopped doing the meditation. I thought, you know, it's all a joke. It's not real. That stuff started happening. It felt like a battery pack on my spine. Go up and down my spine. And uh, it scared me. It didn't go all the way up. It just It's just literally like neck, neck down, maybe a little lower from like the lower part of my neck to like the base of my spine the root chakra whatever kept going up and down and i thought some occultic shit was happening like i thought i was gonna die i was really scared it gave me even more evidence of completely stopping the program all stopping meditation altogether i got scared for my life i thought occultic stuff was on me you know at some point um had a buddy he was just like you know he was introducing me to christian material so now you know, the journey I'd been through, I, I was so scared. I started praying with the Christians and, you know, became a Christian, whatever, you know. Now, this is like towards the end of my prison journey. Eventually, I came home and I was still scared and shook up from everything that coming home from prison. I was like, yeah, I, you know, felt, I guess I'm a Christian, you know, I read the Bible and stuff. I even tried going to, going to church. I'm not having it. Like, you know, at first you're kind of enthused by everything, but then, you know, you're not I'm not really enjoying it like there's no fruit there's no reward there's no like spirit in it eventually I, I, I can't go anymore it's draining me eventually I get really depressed I get extremely depressed about you know two years in two years after being home and eventually um I get back into meditation and my depression lifts and it's only been a few weeks but like it's if it, it's it feels like that dark night of the soul is left. Mm -hmm. So now when you speak about like the guru phenomenon and being um, very cautious about everything, you know, have discernment, you know, it makes me think because the Shakti from the guru is extremely palpable. It's like proof, right? Like I had proof back when I met the healers in Virginia Beach. It's proof. 
like Earl, for example, the guy in prison who told me about Siddha Yoga, he had Shaktipat in prison. He was like an old school, you know, white supremacist guy. He'd tell me stories about, you know, race riots, stabbings, you know, stuff I don't even, I won't even share on, on, on here, right? Uh, he, he even had crazy stories about him escaping prison. He did all kinds of crazy stuff. So when he told me about Shaktipat, to me, being a search, searching for God, he gave me like clear and convincing proof that God is real. So even though I don't like to, you know, fall in love with the guru and, you know, they, they get all cuckoo and weird at times. The Shakti I like, but the person gets really cringe at times, to be honest. So it's made me quite like you're you're stirring stuff up in my intellect, like making me really question like, yeah, you know, I don't like worshiping the guru like that. I like worshiping the energy. And I feel like I have to worship the guru because he emanates this energy. But at the same time, look at him from my point of view. Man, I wanted to die a few weeks ago. Like, I was just, you know, I honestly think, you know, death would be easier. You know, I start think, thinking things were better in prison. But then, you know, I come back to not, not the exact guru that I followed, but one of like his, like somebody who branched off of him. Um, in that same, like that bottom butter, that lineage. And like he, his Shakti just awakened everything in me and I felt really good. And I was, so I, <laughs> listening to you now, it's just like, you know, you're, you're making aware, making me aware of things that I didn't want to say, because I can't talk to fellow Siddha Yogis and be like, you know what, man, all this Sadhguru Maharaj stuff is really cringe. And it's really, really, uncom it's just stupid. And I can't relate to you guys, but I love the energy. You know, how do you how do you relate to somebody on that level? So now I'm questioning, like, man, even doing Om Namah Shivaya, I mean, I do that because I feel like that'll increase the Shakti, but at times I feel like it's not doing anything. So that's my story. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And uh, I mean, it's fascinating experiences. And it's a great example. It's a great example of, you know, we have so many individuals from so many walks of life on the path, some with genuine psychic abilities, genuine energetic abilities, genuine ability to give Shakti pot, but it's the Shakti that is the actual um, essence here, not the individual per se. Yeah. That's why, like I was sharing with um, someone earlier that the guru, that's just a costume, right? We're not worshiping the, the individual. We're worshiping through div through an emotional relationship with the divine energy itself. And Can uh, I interrupt real quick? Yeah, please. It's like, look, it's like God is throwing you a curveball, though. Because, look, if you're really hungry and there's no food and somebody offers you food and they seem to be the only person with the food, then it's like you're going to stick to them, right? And even, like, the Hindu scriptures, they, they stress, you know, time and time again the importance of the guru. You cannot go anywhere without the guru. The guru is God, you know. Even th these were principles that I was raised with. Yeah. So it's just like, how come I haven't been able to get in touch with Shakti on my own without the guru? It's like God's throwing you a curveball. Either that or it's an extremely profound test because 99% of people, they'll say, you know, the guru is God. I love the guru. The guru can do any, any he can have any what way with me that he pleases. But me, I'm like, no, there's something off about it. True. Sure. We need um, to be very discerning with even this term guru as well, right? Um, traditionally, the guru wasn't just a teacher per se. They were, they were somebody with, with um, you know, they had attained God, right? They had attained a, a state of union. And some of them were avatars, right? They, they come in and, uh, you know, they're, they're, direct reincarnations of, of the divine. And so these are the individuals that many would say, you know, we must revere. But here um, in the West, there's very few genuine gurus. And of course, guru is a word out of a particular tradition, a particular system. And that for the most part, many people have been removed from that system. The system worked so well throughout India. I mean, that's why India has been, you know, has given us so many incredible gifts on the path. But um like at least for like say and in people like you or I, um, you know, like the energy healer that I encountered, if I refer to her as my guru, it's like it's it's a complete appropriation 
because it has nothing to do with with uh, the, the Vedic system per se. There's no reason for me to see her as a guru. And uh, but I understand even where you're coming from, like the disillusionment when you realize these types of things. It's like startling. It'll just very startling. Um, so I'll go over here to uh, to Tom here. Tom, go ahead and and share what's on your mind, and then we'll go over to Crystal. I read the book. Uh... The Sacred Power it was called by uh, a Swami Kripananda, I think, and uh, so I looked at the pictures of uh, of the a guru in there, uh, and I thought, well, if uh, if what they say about you is true, and uh, you know, the book had to do about Kundalini, so and, and giving Shakti button things like that, and I said, well, it was late at night, I'd come back from work, and I was busy having a smoke and watching the news, but ten forty five at night, and. Uh, I looked at the picture and I said, well, if you're what they say you are, uh, I'm just going to focus on you as I go to bed. And then I'm going, maybe you can give me Shakti, but if you're what they say you are, I'm being pretty flippant about it because I really didn't, you know, looking at a picture, like, come on. Uh, went to bed, woke up in the morning, nothing. So uh, I went to work and came back again about 10 o'clock at night and sitting there having a smoke at uh, watching the news at 10.45. And all of a sudden it was like, you ever see an atom bomb go off when you see the concentric circles coming out of the chat? You're out, out of, out of, you know, of heat. Yeah. That's what it was like for me. Or I could see concentric circles, not of heat, but of energy. And it looked like if you drop a pebble into a pond that is perfectly still, and there are circles coming out from the inside. Except these circles were coming out of me, my heart, and they were coming out, and they were actually going through the room, and I could see them go through the room. And as they went past something, it was like a heat mirage, you know, like from a, from a jet plane. Like when, when you look at the uh, flame coming out of the back of a jet, and it yeah. shimmers and and things uh, distort. It looked like that. And at a certain distance from me, uh, things became to come, started to come into reality. As to say, the laws of physics began to function, and I could see things like music suddenly becoming real and and furniture becoming real not that it was unreal when i was there but it was like you could symbolically uh, is what i mean i mean it was like the room was there um but i could see all this stuff happening and uh i just started crying and it was so joyful it was well, up, uh, up there among the three or four top experiences i've ever had of of, of happiness of joy it just went on and on and on. This, this stuff coming out of my, out of me that was just permeating the entire universe. Uh, so I'm the guru. Uh, no kidding. Uh, so uh, that was the first. Anyway, I finally had to go to bed, and I did. And the next day, things had pretty well calmed down. Now, a few months before that, I had had a, an induced a sort of a, on the verge of suicide. I had induced a kind of similar reaction not like that though but it was like i was gonna well i'm gonna jump off the balcony so i said show me something good about myself and i'd gone a light had gone on inside my head and went right down to the bottom of my spine and then came back up again and i began to have all sorts of uh well the psychiatrist called them delusions and hallucinations but they were visions of things and i looked into like you no know, you see so hokey but you know look at someone and see their souls well, you know, remember the old Roman Catholic, I think it is, uh, the theory of uh, the stain on the soul. You get one stain if you do a sin and then another one, another one, another one. Pretty soon your soul is totally black. Well, I looked at my own and it was perfectly pure. I looked at every, other people's because it went on for weeks. This, And I didn't see one black stain on any soul. So you can kick that theory to the curb. Uh, and when I received Shakti Bhatt, though, before that, all these strange occurrences, like the so-called hallucinations and all that stuff, were chaotic. They would just come and go as they pleased. After Shaktipat, they all sort of lined up and began to follow a certain kind of path. It was no longer hit and miss, but everything everything sort of went on as it uh, as one would hope. So it became easier to bear, easier to take to to, to uh, to experience e easier to live with because i wasn't surprised anymore by something coming out of left field or right field depending on what path this was uh anyhow that was uh that was uh that was it i imagine 
yeah, that was a that was that experience. Lots of others, but uh, oh, I'll, I'll leave stuff. it at that. Yeah, thank you, thank you for sharing. Yeah, sometimes just just asking, and it and it comes. And uh, it's interesting that you said you know you asked in a flippant way and still got a, a very powerful response. Um, I've heard many many people, myself included, if you ask with a certain emotional fervor, often that's when the prayers get answered. Um, you know, uh, I, I've, I've seen this time and time again, it's people that just really at their wits end ask and a prayer gets answered. It's that emotional energy behind the ask that really fuels it. So fantastic stuff, Tom. Thank you for sharing. We'll go over to uh, Crystal. Hey, Crystal. Hello. Hi, I'm here. Hey, thanks for your patience, Crystal. Yes. So I, I feel like I want to share a bit of my story. Um, I feel like it might help somebody else. Um, I had a very spontaneous awakening. I fell and smashed my tailbone. And within a month, my energy body woke up and my world did a 360. I was working in IT. I was working for the man and everything just kind of collapsed. My relationship, my job, everything it was just a messy time but at the same time I was um, living on a farm and I had horses and when my energy body woke up one of the blockages was at the back of my neck and ultra ultra um, or the zeal chakra I don't know well, I've heard a lot of different names for it but anyways it was it was vibrating and I was in my pasture and digging up some garbage. There's metal and glass in there because it's an old yard site. And one of my horses came up behind me and he started nuzzling on the back of my neck. And they do this to release energy. And I recognized what he was doing, but I was in a very vulnerable position. So I was like, okay, Spike, do your thing, hurry up and do what you gotta do. So he was able to release it. And I felt this flush of energy and it went coursing through my body all the way down to my toes and into the earth and it was profound like I I knew this thing was there and I'd been working on it for a while trying to move it and nothing helped but within like minutes this horse was able to flush it out of my system so um, the horses became kind of my guru in a sense they really gave me some guidance um, I was in a very toxic relationship and it was with one of my horses that I was having a very weeping moment saying, I think I need to leave my, my partner and my relationship. And uh, she proceeded to put her foot, her, her mouth around my foot. And horses don't do that. <laughs> they, they don't go for humans like that in that way. But she, she didn't put pressure or anything, but she was just giving me, and it was my right foot. So she was pretty much telling me that was the right step to do. And so, yeah, that was the beginning of a very hard breakup. But um, I've uh, done lots of different things to try and help move my bot, my energy and um, keep grounded because I've gone through the DP. DR thing and that was a very mystical experience that kind of threw me for a tailspin but I was also smoking a lot of weed and smoking cigarettes and knowing that I wasn't truly in alignment with myself and I've released all of those I allowed the purification to happen and I'm feeling a lot more centered with things now and I still work with the horses and I still I created a program that gives me alignment and balance and centering and the horses are in a sense, my partner in it. Um, but I also like, we were, we've been talking a little bit in this call about, about gurus and stuff and where I'm standing with everything. Now I, I see myself as a guru, my horses as a guru, but it's more like a heel or heel E relationship. And I find that a lot of the relationships and people that are in my life now, that's, kind of what it is it's a two-way road and traffic's going in both directions not just one way anymore and so that's that's that feels good like it's an equal balanced relationship instead of just a one-way street type of thing so I, I feel like that's a more harmonious place to be and uh yeah but I I work a lot with the horses and I would do a lot of yoga 
Um, but my, my activities have shifted a little bit where I've seen myself wanting expansion and I've been running actually just like literally running. And that kind of feels good. Like that grounded aspect of foot on the pavement, well on the grass in my case, but um, the other thing that I purchased the other day, and I'm just kind of curious if anybody's ever had any experiences. I've done a lot of yoga, Kundalini yoga, and just all the various forms, a lot of meditations, but I picked up a chi machine. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Have you heard of a chi machine? No, I haven't. Well, it's a device that you lay down and you put your ankles on it and it just shakes and it kind of gives you a back and forth motion, but it's supposed to mimic like a fish swimming so it kind of gives that like dna coiled like energetic feeling in your body but i just picked it up yesterday and i tried it out today and afterwards like my whole body is tingling like i can feel the energy just flowing through me and then afterwards i feel really grounded so it like i i look at it some aspect like this is a mechanic and this is a tool but I know I like I've done spring forest qigong and that works really well too. And uh, but it's a little bit of a slower pace. This one I find it kind of gets to it quicker, kind of like the horse energy, I guess, because the horse was able to release it really quickly. So, but yeah, I'm kind of curious to know what people's experiences have been with like yoga versus qigong and like what what types of um, energy modalities that people use that seem that they find her the most beneficial and can help move the energies like i truthfully that horse ex yeah the horse experience to me was the best i would rather just have a horse walking around with me all day if, if they could do that because that was very quick so if anybody has an opportunity to go and connect with a horse or even go the the animals to me were they're profound and uh pretty amazing so wow but yeah, if anybody has any feedback on what modalities they use, I'm kind of curious to know what they find works the best for them. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. So that's really, really fascinating stuff. Now, um, briefly, because I just want to wrap up a couple of things before we begin to wind down. You've hurt your tailbone. Did you fall off a horse? No, I was okay. walking in the Superstore parking lot. Okay. I have in the past fallen off horses, but no, they... they um, I do animal assisted learning. So they're my partners. Mm -hmm. I work with, with people and with them, but the horse connects with the person and I facilitate the program. Great. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. And if anybody has any, uh, any insight, uh, you can type in the chat there on YouTube or zoom, but, but Crystal really, really fascinating stuff. Um, the other day I, I shared an exaggerated example of how sort of uh, blunt force trauma to the tailbone can trigger an awakening. And the example that came through me was somebody might fall off a horse. Then I spoke with <laughs> uh, Julie Hoyle. Uh, I had did an interview with her and she said that early on she fell off a horse and that had a, a major part uh, in her awakening process. Now you're sharing that you didn't fall off a horse, but the horse has helped you with the awakening process itself. So I'm just thinking there's a, there's a theme here. And in all of my exploration, I actually haven't seen any uh, writing about uh, horses um uh, and in this process um and there i know there must be i know that horses there is like a community of people that kind of use horses as part of their healing work and whatnot but in particular kundalini so uh chris if you send me an email i'll keep your email handy i'm thinking throughout my journey if i come across anybody else that has some similar experiences to you maybe you can connect and there can be some pieces that are put together because i think this is maybe i'm wrong but i think this is an area that is untapped um the horse and the energetic phenomena and the kundalini stuff. I think there's something uh, something fresh going on there. But if anybody knows anything else about horses and kundalini, please um, send me an email. I'm very, very curious about that. So thank you so much, Crystal. I, I really appreciate it. So Lisa says, question, how does the ascension energies affect our kundalini awakening? I would say that uh, kundalini awakening is part of the collective ascension that's happening on the planet. And so... Um, uh, when, when people are receiving ascension energies from like the universe, from like the central sun and, and the solar flares and all that kind of stuff, um, it may cause certain uh, energetic phenomena in your body to get amped up. Emotions can get amped up. You can get tired, maybe psychic phenomena, 
maybe make you ripe to have a sort of a shakti pot experience, that sort of thing. Uh, Molly here says, does sex transmit the energy even more than normal everyday contact? So it can, but not necessarily. Of course, these are some of the, the roots of this, you know, uh, this idea of tantric sex and tantra being all about sex comes because it was used as a context for transmission. Um, not just energetic transmission as well. It was also used for um, th the sexual component was used for, for um, you know, um, seeing the divine in everything as well. Um, things like that. But um, sex in particular, of course, is very intimate, very intimate. It can put people into the moment, into a meditative state, into a state of trust, surrender, receptive openness uh, to be willing to give and to receive. So it can create context for powerful transmission to take place, but not necessarily. And um, it's not the only way. If anybody ever tells you that the only way, you know, to have a Shaktipat is through sex, or if you have sex with me, you, you know, you'll have, uh, you'll receive Shaktipat and you'll get all your problems solved and you'll get enlightened, blah, blah, blah. They're using that to manipulate you. Run the other way very quickly. Do not entertain any of that. Um, it is possible to transmit through sex. Yes, it is possible, but there's too much at risk. It's too delicate. It is just something that we should steer clear from because we have so many other safe avenues where we can, of, co of course, you know, receive Shaktipat. Um, so don't let anybody use that to manipulate you. I know that it's, it is a thing that uh, some people will say, oh, you know, I'm, if you have sex with me, you'll get the Shakti from me and this and that. And it's no, 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 no. But uh, with consensual partners, for example, can be context for some powerful transmissions, definitely. You can check out kundaliniawareness.org. It's submit your stories there. Some people have shared some really great stories tonight. If you can type that up, proofread it, share it. So many others will benefit from it. I see here in the chat, people are thanking one another, saying, hey, thank you so much for sharing. That was a great story. Please put that on kundaliniawareness.org. It will really mean a lot to the community, to one another. I'm Hi, um, so it's in regards to this thing, I hear it all the time, uh, to let go, because I feel like I have a lot of, and we're not supposed to call them blockages, it's Kundalini working on the area, but, um, you know, they're just uncomfortable. Anyway, um, and I've been told from the very start of this, just let go, you know, once you surrender and trust, everything is going to be okay. And um, it's been a year now, and I'm surrendering. I'm completely in trust. I love Kundalini. I love everything that we're going through. I mean, I, I, I don't work. I don't, you know, all that. I've completely given this process 100% of my attention and just let it do its thing. But things are kind of getting worse again. Things calm down a bit, and now it's worse again. And so I'm just not sure, like... Is driving me crazy. Am I missing something or is this like normal? What does it even mean to let go? I'm trying. <laughs> so yeah. if you have any on this at all, it would yeah. be really appreciated. Yeah, to let go, yeah. to give up resistance, to surrender, to trust the process, to go with the flow. Yeah, yeah. So um, not unusual at all, right? So when we let go, it's, it's a true, true letting go. Not letting go, hoping that it gets better, but letting go regardless of what happens. So that's the tricky paradox here. Many people will want to let go in the hopes that it gets better. And then when it gets worse or challenging again, because it happens in phases and stages, then they cling. They say, oh, I thought I let go and it got worse. So I'm going to cling again and resist. But we have to let go and try and commit to that and just give all of it to the process and say, let this take 10,000 lifetimes. I trust so much in this process in God and Shakti. Let it take as long as it needs to take. So easier said than done, of course. It's very difficult, probably impossible to let go in one instant for the rest of eternity. It happens in stages, in phases, in layers. We let go once. We enjoy some of the relief. Things get difficult. We go into resistance that we have to learn to let go again. It happens in layers, in stages, phases, um, as well, the process itself, you'll get in the earlier parts, the first few years can be quite challenging, quite up and down. Then you'll get some more longer periods of reprieve and then some shorter but intense periods of difficulty. And also keep in mind, Kundalini awakening aside, people have difficulty in life, period. 
they get sick, relationships get difficult, the economy, all sorts of things cause difficulty. And we're not exempt from that, even if we are in a state of let go. So we let go not in the hopes of being totally at ease and being in a total state of relief, but we let go in total trust and knowing that whatever's coming is, is not going to last forever. And we just, uh, you know, ride the waves, ride the waves as opposed to resisting. But what you're experiencing is not uncommon at all. And um, be easy on yourself if you find yourself, you know, feeling frustrated about it. It's that's part of the journey as well. So I, I hope that helps. Thanks. Oh, you're so welcome. Great. So uh, Colin's saying here, I was going to ask my neighbors if I can hang out with their horses. Yeah, do that and let me know if anything interesting happens. So for those on the Zoom, I've got the uh, private Facebook group link in the chat. We've got a bunch of links there, kundaliniawareness.org. If you'd like to make a donation to support me in doing this work, I really appreciate it. It allows me to keep going. Thank you so much to all those that have donated at any point. Appreciate it. Um, I've got my course, Grounded Spiritual Emergence and Integration. For those that are experiencing uh, you know, intense energy in the body, they're wondering, how do I integrate this into my life? What do I do with this energy that has been uh, you know, awakened? The uh, course, Grounded, is for you. I've also got one-to-one uh, -one, uh, meetings. If you'd like to meet with me one-on-one -on -one to go deep in private, we can meet for an hour, discuss whatever it is that you like. As well, tomorrow, 2 p.m. Eastern, we've got the Kundalini Q&A meeting. It's free. Join us. Um, it won't be streamed live on YouTube. A little bit more intimate. Uh, Monday, 2 p.m. Eastern. Join us. We'll take some questions. And maybe if there's time, uh, we'll get to a little bit of sharing as well. I appreciate you all on YouTube. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Leela, Martin. Zaid, Alchemy Frequency, 